So welcome everybody to today's seminar and the, the, today's webinar, which will present the statement made by members of the Culture 2030 Goal Coalition on culture and the COVID-19 pandemic, focusing on how we can ensure that culture fulfills its potential in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. Since the statement was first published a month ago, already over 160 people and organizations have signed. Today, we're making the formal launch and hope that many more of you will do so. What we're going to be trying to do here is to present the statement, its contents, the logic behind it, both to those of you who are able to join us live and those who are watching and, and those watching the recording, but also, um, So we will present the statement and its contents to those of you who are able to join us live, but also those who are joining the recording, but also put it into context from the perspective of the different members of the coalition who helped to put it together. Now, this webinar is going to be li is live on YouTube. And so I would like to invite anyone who does have questions, please to do so through the questions bar that you should find on the right of your screen on YouTube. Um, there is normally a short lag between the webinar and the streaming itself. And so please be a little bit patient with us and do of course ask your questions as we go along. Now, as you will see, we have a wide number of speakers with us today. Um, we will have, first of all, a presentation on the background of the statement from Gordy Pasquale and Terry Badia. Jordi Pasquale is the coordinator of the United Cities and Local Governments Culture Committee, and Terry Badia is the Secretary General of Culture Action Europe. Secondly, we will have Celia Fisher, Secretary General of the International Music Council, giving her perspective from, the, from her perspective. Then, Ege Yildirim, focal point on the Sustainable Development Goals for the International Council on Monuments and Sites, will present. Then we will hear from Beat Sanchi, President of the International Federation of Coalitions for Cultural Diversity. After that, Pierre Clavier Mabiela, President of Arterial Network, will talk, followed by Jose Alfonso Suarez de Real, Caterina Vaz Pinto, and Enrique Avogadro, who are co presidents of United Cities and Local Governments Culture Committee. Next, Robert Manchin, the President of Culture Action Europe. And then myself, Stephen Weiber, Manager for Policy and Advocacy at IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, will talk. Finally, we're honoured to have Christopher Bailey, the Arts and Health Lead at the World Health Organization, who will give us his perspective and the perspective of the WHO on the role of art and culture in health. There's a lot of speakers, but we will all be looking to be brief in order to make sure that you have the possibility to ask questions at the end. And just to repeat, please, of course, look to do this through the chat function on YouTube. Therefore, I would like now to hand over to Jordi Pasquale and Terry Badia in order to talk about the background to the statement. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear Stephen. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning to, to all. This uh, statement is not the first that the campaign Culture 2030 Goal has produced. The, the campaign was born in 2013 when uh, several networks uh, met to uh, try to have a standalone goal in the uh, post-2015 uh, agenda, as it was called at that moment, now the uh, 2030 agenda. Um, at that moment, in the period 2013-2015, the members of the campaign uh, wrote four documents. Um, they uh, struggled to uh, place culture 
at the uh, center of the uh, 2030 agenda. These, these documents are in uh, a website, our website. Um, the website of Culture 2030 uh, Agenda. Um, now, um, a few months ago, in September 2019, we produced another document, uh, a, a report, um, whose uh, aim was to analyze the uh, what the uh, high-level political forum, the uh, UN body that is uh, monitoring the progress of the Sustainable Development Goals and the SDGs. Um, that that uh, that that uh, report that we uh, published in uh, September 2019 explains the uh, not enough uh, progress, the very short uh, progress that we um, thought could be the convenient progress to have culture at the at the center of the global conversation on on development um, the website of our campaign is online and you can uh, download the statement that we have produced in april after the uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis, and uh, you can also uh, sign the statement. Um, I would like also to, to finish this, this uh, my words, uh, remembering a friend, Javier Brun, who passed away on, on Sunday. This, this campaign is the result of the work of, of many people and Javier passed away after a sudden heart attack on Sunday last week, and my words are a tribute to, to him. Thank you very much. So, yeah, thank you, uh, Jordi. That's uh, Tere Badia from Cold Action Europe, Secretary General. Uh, so thank you all for being with us today. Uh, as Jordi was mentioning, Culture 2030 Gold Movement wanted to add its voice uh, to the multiplicity of statements and positions regarding this unprecedented crisis provoked by the COVID pandemic. Uh, all sectors have been activated during this crisis. The social, health, economy and culture have been fundamental in reinforcing the solidarity and resilience of the communities and maintaining them together. Specifically, we have been clearly witnessing the, in the past months that culture has shown the capacities in promoting well-being in individuals and communities, guaranteeing access to information and encouraging awareness, tolerance, reflection, and also imagination from where to start both preparing society and imagining the possible futures, no matter the challenges that we will face in the future. But too often in the past, culture has been, has been the first to be compromised by political decisions. And of course, in the consequent uh, budget, we cannot afford that this happens again, because more than now, and more than uh, more now and more than ever, uh, we really need to recognize and incorporate and support cultural concerns in the response of this to this crisis, and in the planning for the recovery. Social, environmental, and economical and cultural approaches must lay the foundation of an equal healing for all the base or for all on the basis of the appliance of the fundamental rights, including the cultural rights. The, the seven goals in our statement goes, uh, go in this direction. 
the first one, um, it's a specific support, a call for support for cultural communities, cultural actors and organizations that have been hardly hit, uh, hard hit during the pandemic, because we cannot lose any of them in our present and our future. Failing to support culture in these times will lead to a considerable with the deterioration of the richness and diversity of the global cultural ecosystem. <clears throat> the second call is a uh, second call is called to reinforce access to the digital, digital sphere and to technology for all to avoid inequalities in the education, the access of information and the manifestations of the plurality of cultures. The third one ensures, uh, tries to ensure uh, that the regulations, legal frameworks and funding schemes are able to react with flexibility to facilitate and support both people's life and its cultural practices. And beyond the sectorial approach, the fourth goal is uh, it's, uh, it's the consideration that neglecting culture at this crucial point can have enormous consequence for the whole societies. There is an urgency to include culture and cultural perspectives in a permanent dialogue with the social, economical, and environmental actors if we want to repair and rebuild the, so the social tissue in equality and solidarity. The fifth of our calls uh, is um, remarked on the need to place well-being, solidarity, and sustainability at the center of the cultural policies because these are intrinsic qualities of resilient and collaborative communities. To reinforce the cultural rights among the fundamental rights is also our sixth call, and to ensure the rich context of the complexity for the complexity and interdependence of all cultural practices and expressions. And last but not least, culture should be put at the heart of the response to this crisis today, and must be considered as the fourth pillar of the Sustainable Development Goals, as it contains a transformative power crucial for building a sustainable future for all. Moreover, we would like again to remark the importance of maintaining a permanent and open dialogue between decision makers and all social and economical and health agents and cultural actors, and include them in overarching debates that affect any aspect of the SDGs together with fundamental issues in the social, economical, and environmental fields. And paraphrasing the very beginning of our Collective Culture 2030 Goal campaign, launched already in 2015, as Jordi was mentioning, I will finish with the sentence that the future we want, and here I will include and add, the future we need includes culture. So thank you very much for hearing. Thank you very much, Terry, and thank you very much, Jordi, for explaining the background and the contents of the statement. Um, I would encourage, of course, anyone who is interested to, to read the statement in more depth. It's up in five or six languages, I think, now. And if you just look for Culture 2030 Goal um, in your search engine of choice, you'll be able to find it there and read it yourself. I would now like to hand over to Celia Fisher, who is the Secretary General of the International Music Council, and will be asking, and so therefore, Celia, it would be great to hear from you what the statement means for you and for your members and for the constituency that you represent. Yes, thank you very much, Stephen. The contribution of the International Music Council to the statement is driven by our intimate belief that the experience of music and music making is a vital part of the everyday life of all people. In its holistic approach to music as an ecosystem, the International Music Council acknowledges the intrinsic value of music enriching and inspiring those who engage in it. But music can also serve as a tool that promotes individual development and brings change to many levels of society. And finally, music is involved in a variety of products that contribute to domestic and international trade, economic growth and job creation. But in all of its manifestations, music is a tremendously precious resource for humanity. And this brings us here to this statement. During the lockdown, billions of people were and are turning to culture and notably to music as a source of comfort, of well-being and connection. And for many of us, music in its myriad forms has occupied an important place in our lives at home. 
We have seen members of choirs, orchestras, chamber ensembles and bands create together, albeit individually from their homes, new musical experiences for the enjoyment of many. Such initiatives sprang from the desire of these professional or amateur artists to continue creating together while serving their communities. Yes, the music community has responded and musicians were also at the forefront as they wrote and produced songs to create awareness and call on populations to adopt distancing and sanitary measures and attitudes. In this respect, we salute notably the mobilization of musicians and music professionals in Africa and Latin America. At the same time, we are worried to see the negative impact of the pandemic with concerts canceled, festivals postponed, al album launches delayed, living heritage practices and expressions interrupted, music schools and academies closed, you name it. The impact on the livelihood of many players in the music ecosystem is devastating. Many are independent workers or work in small and medium-sized enterprises. They are particularly vulnerable and need to be included in response measures. We are concerned that the already pre-existing precarious situation of our colleagues is exacerbated by the crisis. We call for actions today, as the statement says, that to ensure that they can survive the crisis and are able to play their part in the recovery tomorrow. Moreover, as many players in the music ecosystem turn to the digital sphere to create, disseminate, promote, sell, teach, we are deeply concerned about the inequalities in terms of access and capacities to harness the potential of the digital, both for artists and their public. We are equally concerned about the fact that these digital inequalities include the lack of fair remuneration for creators and performers of music. Responses to the crisis tend to be short term and national, while regional and international cooperation and coordination in addressing the pandemic faces long term challenges. However, cross border cooperation and mobility are an integral part of thriving music ecosystem and needs to have a central role in the building of more resilient communities. The statement calls for reinforcing the protection of cultural rights. To promote the access for, to music for all and the value of music in the lives of all people is the declared mission of the International Music Council. Our values are embedded in the five music rights, which revolve around the themes of freedom of music expression, music education for all, access to musical involvement, artistic development and communication, and recognition of and fair remuneration for artists' works. For us, the question is, how can we make sure that these rights continue to be respected during and in the aftermath of crisis? For example, we are alerted by reports from colleagues all over the world pointing to the COVID-19 crisis exacerbating attacks, attacks on freedom of music expression as global nationalist populism continues to restrict expressions and emergency procedures are enacted with which sometimes serve as mobile to silence dissident voices. The question of how the five music rights hold up in times of pandemic will be at the heart of a debate organized by the International Music Council in the framework of the UNESCO Resilient Movement. We have invited our music rights champions to offer their views on this matter and discuss with the UNESCO Assistant Director General for Culture possible avenues to efficiently advocate for cultural policies and funding mechanisms that put our shared values in the heart of the COVID-19 response. I invite you to join this, us for this debate, which will take place on May 27th at 11.30 CST. We need governments and all other decision makers to act today. We need them to support all those who belong to the music ecosystem and whose livelihoods and work are threatened. Every dollar, every euro, every peso, etc., not invested now will cost so much more after the crisis when trying to rebuild musical infrastructures. And in some cases, this will not even be possible. Otherwise, as musician and composer Jean-Michel Jarre put it during the first UNESCO Resilia debate, if we don't address the, the difficulties facing culture and arts now, they will be suffering for generations. 
For the International Music Council, it is to ensure that every child and adult and every musical artist can continue enjoying their music rights today, tomorrow and the decades ahead. And for our common future in the long term, it starts with recognizing that culture is both a, cult a driver and an enabling factor of successful sustainable development and that it needs to be integrated across government action at all levels everywhere. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Celia, for the powerful intervention and for explaining how meaningful this is for musicians and, of course, those who enjoy music on the ground. I would like now to invite Ege Yildirim, uh, who is the SDG Focal Point for the International Council on Monuments and Sites, to intervene. Ege, over to you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, can you see me on the screen? Um, I'm not sure. I can't. Am I, should I see myself right now? Yes. Okay, very good. Thank you. So thank you for this opportunity. Greetings from Istanbul, where I am based um, on behalf of ICOMOS, the International Council on Monuments and Sites, which has its headquarters based in Paris. And I am here on behalf of our president, Toshi Kono, our secretary general, Peter Phillips, and director general, Marie-Laure Labonier, who um, would have loved to be here and um, send their greetings through me. Um, so um, firstly, um, a couple of remarks on the Culture 2030 Gold Campaign. So ICOMOS has been a partner of this from the start. Um, it's been several years now, and uh, uh, we are deeply committed to, um, to this partnership because of the visioning of um, the vision of partnering with as many stakeholders as possible in a wide range of synergy is what we believe will really achieve sustainable development also in our field. Um, and it seemed inevitable that we would also um, come together for a COVID-19 response um, because this is the game changer for sustainable development and all our lives, all our actions in the culture sector as well. So um, I'm representing um, an organization that deals with cultural heritage. Um, cultural heritage is just one aspect of the culture sector, but we share many things with our culture uh, professional um, friends here as well. But I'll try to um, touch on our common concerns and a few special uh, concerns as well, uh, if I can. Um, so is uh, the primary global NGO. Thousand members, 107 national committees. We work to produce guidelines, theory, and capacity building um, and action for cultural heritage preservation. Uh, we have 28 scientific committees and six working groups, uh, which are now working on making sure that all issues are transversal and connected, um, connecting culture, nature, human rights, climate change, and the SDGs, which I'm, I'm responsible for. Um, and cultural heritage uh, basically is um, the ex all expressions of um, ways of life of humanity over uh, the history, um, from the past to the present to the future. So this time continuity is uh, especially important for us. It has both tangible and intangible aspects. At the moment, our tangible aspects are suffering especially. Um, we are... Um, sharing um, the concerns of our culture um, sector um, colleagues um, in terms of how the, the cultural heritage sector is under threat of losing livelihoods, um, of revenue sources, um, and also the neglect of cultural heritage sites. And uh, one particular future of cultural heritage is how we are so place-based. Um, cultural heritage sites, monuments, museums, they will never be the same as looking at it from the screen and being there. There is still a difference. At the moment, during the COVID response, the cultural heritage community has responded as best as we can, providing virtual platforms to experience sites and um, museums. This is much appreciated by um, society. Um, but we are thinking ahead into how to uh, maintain our sites long term as well. And we also um, share the same concerns of neglect uh, in policy and funding, how economic stimulus packages will um, hopefully not forget about uh, the deeds of cultural heritage uh, protection. So basically, the, the message and um, the bottom line is how we are both vulnerable, but we are also an immense um, resource. And protecting the resource um, protects us from the vulnerabilities. And this is a virtual cycle for actually sustainable development in the post-COVID world. 
um, especially tourism is uh, one aspect where um, heritage sites um, are um, being hit and we might see a local tourism um, development um, getting stronger in the future. Um, just like all cultural expressions, cultural heritage is also supporting um, social well-being and resilience and the knowledge from the heritage, the history about how to actually cope with such crises is something that we are trying to harness as well. The behavior change, it is a cultural phenomenon, we are cultural beings, so how to harness the cultural aspect of human actions for uh, better responses. So these are um, various aspects of how we're trying to prepare for the um, coming uh, months and years. Uh, so basically I share with my colleagues the, the call for all decision makers to have a culture as a concern um, at the heart um, of the response, our decisions and actions going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you Ege very much for the intervention and thank you also for making the link with the origin of the Culture 2030 campaign and what we're really trying to go for in terms of integrating culture into these much broader policy discussions, not only in the context of COVID-19, but also globally. I would now like to invite Bayat Sanchi, who is the president of the International Federation of Coalitions for Cultural Diversity, um, in order to give the perspective from, the, from his organization and that of your members. Bayat. Thank you, Stefan, and I'm happy that you learned that my name was not Beat, but Beat. Uh, the International Federation of Coalitions for Cultural Diversity, the IFCCD, is the voice of cultural professionals around the world. It brings together some 30 organizations from all five continents, representing creators, artists, independent producers, distributors, broadcasters, and publishers in the book, film, television, music, live performance, and visual arts sectors. The IFCCD was created as a result of a major mobilization of civil society in favor of the adoption, ratification, and implementation of the UNESCO Convention on the Protection and Promotion of the Diversity of Cultural Expressions. Therefore, we as civil society must remind the member states of the convention of their right and duty to protect and promote their own cultural sector, as well as to cooperate with other countries to make sure that the planet's precious cultural diversity can be saved over to the post-crisis period. As we know, it is very easy to close down an orchestra, a theater or dance company, a film production company, etc., etc but it takes very, very long and hard work to rebuild them once they're lost. The current crisis has had and is still having devastating effects on the cultural life of most countries, both developed and developing. At the same time, many people seem to realize much more than before how important culture is for their daily life and well-being, now that they have limited access to it. Indeed, culture has always been the main driver of human civilization. Therefore, it must be at the core of sustainable development. There's no way around it if we want to succeed. However, the crisis also puts the vulnerability of the cultural sector into the spotlight. Artists, creators, and cultural workers were among the first to suffer from economical distress because they were no longer allowed to create and perform as they used to. In many countries, the cultural sector is an informal one. Even professional artists barely make a decent living and the lack of social protection is omnipresent. For truly sustainable development in and through culture, it could be beneficial to globally invest in status of the artist legislation as promoted by UNESCO since 40 years. In some countries, governments have announced enormous packages to save the economy, but not always do they include or find the right measures for the needs of the creative industries, and even less for the artists and performers who are often self-employed freelancers. That's why it is extremely important to engage and involve civil society in the design of support measures for the cultural sector 
and generally in the design of any cultural policies and cooperation projects, as artists and cultural practitioners themselves have the best knowledge of their own needs. In times with omnipresent border closures and immigration restrictions, we are called to solidarity, not only with all artists in our own countries, but also with those in the rest of the world. And we should do everything in our power to reestablish and improve the free movement of artists and cultural goods and services, as well as the free flow of expressions and ideas once the actual crisis will be over. That is why emergency powers or surveillance technologies that are being implemented in many countries need to be closely monitored. Equally, we need to be vigilant to counter any tendencies of cultural seal off or cultural nationalism. Online schooling and home office work have added just another boost to an ever increased digital lifestyle for many people. However, access to online services is still not equal for everyone around the globe at all. While streaming cultural expressions over the internet can in some cases enable access for new audiences, others are left out. And it is highly questionable whether cultural activities generally benefit from virtual settings. The widespread assumption that online content should be free of charge is possibly threatening some artists' livelihood even more than the current crisis. This is not a good perspective for sustainable development. But culture still has a very important economic role. In many regions of the world, the creative sector has a higher economic weight than most other sectors. In other words, economically, culture already is at the core of sustainable development in these regions. So why shouldn't it be the same everywhere else? That's why the statement we're launching today is important to us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bayat, and in particular for underlining the importance of action and collaboration at the international level. This is something that clearly comes out clear, that comes out clearly in the statement and is something that clearly as our organizations, all of which work at the international level, have a particularly strong angle on. I would now like to welcome Pierre Clavier Mabiala to speak. Uh, Pierre Clavier, Clavier Mabiala is the president of Arterial Network. And what we will be doing is because Pierre will be presenting in French, we will be doing a consecutive interpretation. So you'll hear a statement in French and then this will be translated to you into English. So Pierre, over to you. Um, merci beaucoup uh, de nous avoir uh, donné uh, cette opportunité. Um, um, il faut reconnaître que uh, si on veut parler de l'importance de la déclaration, il faut reconnaître que cette déclaration soulève uh, des problèmes réels uh, du secteur culturel et des acteurs culturels uh, dans le monde. Um, so, and, uh, je vais vite traduire. So if we want to explain this statement, it's very important that we, we need to address the issues and the subjects that it raises in the world. Okay. Uh, en Afrique, c'est-à-dire le champ d'action de notre réseau artérial, le débat est encore au stade de la reconnaissance de la place de la culture et des acteurs culturels. Euh, donc, euh, on se demande encore qu'est-ce qu'il faut faire parce que vraiment, euh, euh, la culture, l'art, euh, il n'a pas encore eu cette petite reconnaissance-là. Quelques initiatives euh, sont prises par certains chefs d'État, mais ça reste encore par certains États, certains gouvernements, mais le secteur reste encore fragile et précaire. So, in Africa, the debate is still at the stage of ensuring simply that the role of arts and culture itself is recognized. Um, within Africa, there have certainly been some very positive instances of heads of state and government recognizing the important role of culture, but these remain exceptions. And so we have to ask ourselves, what is it that we can do in this situation? 
la déclaration donc euh, reconnaît les faiblesses de la non prise en compte de la culture et des acteurs culturels. La déclaration émet aussi des souhaits en en tirant la, sommet, la sonnette d'alarme au niveau mondial. So the, the declaration is significant in that it recognizes the weakness of what happens, the weakness of any approach that doesn't give the due role to culture in any response. Euh, pour Arterial, le secteur culturel en Afrique, euh, la déclaration est une bonne pièce à conviction pour prouver la fragilité euh, qui devient de plus en plus importante du secteur euh, suite au coronavirus et aux autres obstacles qui peuvent arriver. So for the Arterial Network, the statement sets out the important conviction and underlines the issues that need to be addressed at the time of coronavirus. Euh, la promotion donc de cette déclaration, sa vulgarisation donc au niveau euh, des systèmes des Nations Unies, au niveau des gouvernements, au niveau euh, des mécanismes de la coopération internationale, au niveau de l'Union africaine, au niveau des sous-régions de la euh, de, de l'Union africaine en Afrique, est pour nous une permet d'amplifier en plus l'interpellation des États et du secteur culturel en Afrique. So, for Arterial Network, the promotion of this statement, it's sharing with the United Nations, with governments, with international cooperation mechanisms, with the African Union, and within individual sub-regions within Africa is a priority. We need to focus on spreading it in order to amplify this message and amplify the understanding of the necessity to give culture the place it needs. Si euh, le plus de gens sont interpellés, euh, si euh, la fragilité du secteur est prouvée alors que son importance est reconnue, nous pensons que c'est une bonne chose pour pouvoir faire bouger les choses. Si plus de personnes sont engagées dans ces questions, si plus de personnes comprennent la fragilité du secteur culturel, pour nous, c'est une bonne chose. Euh, euh, nous avons vu dans tous les médias en Afrique pendant cette crise de coronavirus le rôle qu'a joué les artistes, euh, les acteurs culturels dans la sensibilisation, la formation, l'éducation des populations. Euh, personne d'autre ne pouvait le faire que le secteur culturel et les artistes. We have seen through the media, through the role of artists and cultural actors in training, in education. The incomparable, the, the incomparable role that these actors can play at these times. Donc, nous nous pensons que, évidemment, euh, la déclaration euh, va permettre de renforcer les choses, de dynamiser les choses, et on croit nous que euh, euh, on pourra, et surtout ce qui est de l'Afrique, reconnaître le rôle, ce, ce rôle-là. On pourra donner cette place-là. Le corona vient aussi comme pour dire voilà ce que les artistes sont capables de faire. Et ça nous renforce et la déclaration nous aide à faire tout cela. Et c'est pourquoi nous pouvons dire que euh, cette déclaration pour nous a cette importance-là. C'est un vrai élément de plus, un élément de conviction, un élément de plaidoyer, un élément euh, qui nous permet de convaincre davantage. Et c'est ça la position d'artérial. C'est ça, nous, notre positionnement par rapport à la déclaration. Et nous en sommes fiers. Je vous remercie. Et donc, nous pensons que, clairement, que cette statement, que cette déclaration va faire it possible de dynamiser notre argumentation, de dynamiser notre advocacy, et de dynamiser, de donner plus de force dans nos arguments, que nous devons donner un lieu à la culture. Le coronavirus, la pandémie, la COVID-19, Can even be an opportunity to show what artists can do and what they can contribute. This is why it's so important as a statement of belief, of advocacy, and this is why for us as Arterial Network, this provides such an opportunity in our work. Thank you. Donc, merci beaucoup, Pierre. Thank you very much for your intervention and thank you for Sort of underlining how actually the statement itself is going to be useful for you in your engagement with governments and your engagement with international agencies. I would now like to invite Jose Alfonso Suarez Real, Caterina Vaspinto, who I hope is there, uh, and Enrique Avogado, who are the co presidents of the United Cities and Local Governments Cultural Committee. So over to you.
Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great honor for Mexico City to uh, speak uh, to you. I would like to start by extending warm greetings to all from Dr. Reses Claudia Shane Bompardo, head of the government of Mexico City. It is a pleasure for this city to celebrate cultural di diversity with you through a meeting that transcends borders and show the strength that art and culture have to convene. It's power to generate rich dialogues, even in a health emergency like the one we are all experiencing in our different territories. One of the most important and necessary cultural rights is the right to have people's own cultural identities and creative expression recognized. In this time of pandemic, we have been able to observe how necessary culture in its wide range is to articulate the world in which we live. Now, we are, have verified more than ever how culture is an indispensable pillar for the development of societies, but even more, we can see that is a constitutive an inalienable part of the human being, that which helps to give meaning to our lives, even in crisis. Today, we know more than ever that culture is resilience. Facing to the 2030 agenda, we must be in to think about how to reinvent ourselves in what will be a new norma normality through culture that responds to those great challenges such as caring for the environment, rebuilding the post-pandemic world, and the inclusion of all cultural identities. From the Minister of Culture of Mexico City, we wish you the best in this dialogue, and we express our support for the declaration we are talking about. Quali Tonali, thank you very much. Last of Camatl, gracias. Thank you very much, Jose Enrique, and thank you very much for your, your words and encouragement for this, and especially from the perspective of local government, which is such a key actor for so many of us in the cultural sector. In fact, unfortunately, Robert Manchin isn't with us at the moment, so I fear you have me now. Um, so I am Stephen Weiber. I'm speaking to you from the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, we are the international organization for libraries of all sorts, based in the Netherlands, but with members in 153 countries worldwide. Um, overall, we represent about two and a half million libraries globally, many of which are in fact the um, 150 libraries, so 2.5 million libraries globally, many of which represent the most close by, the most easily accessible cultural point of meeting, opportunity to access culture for their users. In some communities, and clearly the, the statistics, are, everyone has their own statistics, um, our libraries can be seen and can be measured as being the single most popular cultural activity that there is out there. I wanted to say from our perspective, um, I agree and we agree so much with so much, so, with so much of what has already been said the importance of collaboration, the importance of balance, the importance of protecting rights and freedom of expression, the importance of ensuring that we are genuinely coming up with solutions that work for everyone, even in particularly difficult times, all resonate with us. Clearly, in the case of libraries, um, when it was uh, with the pandemic turning up and the fact that libraries simply are places where people come together, it was important for the safety of users and of staff to close the doors. However, we've nonetheless seen libraries continue to remain open in other forms, with a real explosion of resourcefulness and inventiveness, a real desire on the part of librarians to continue serving their, serving their users, providing access to culture. Indeed, we've seen a huge surge in demand, with many times more demand for e-books Many thousands of people now signing up to be like members of their local library online. And this, I think, and as others have said, is, an, is a concrete sign, if anything, 
of the importance that culture has for people in times of trouble. Now, a particularly important point for us in what the statement underlined is the need for governments to bear culture in mind. We know that right now governments are facing difficult time, and we know that governments will continue to focus, face difficult times as they will need to pay off the stimulus packages that they're organizing now as economic production falls and tax revenues fall. We know that even when the pandemic can be declared over, the challenges that we will face cannot stop. However, in particular in these difficult times, this is when it's most important to take decisions in a holistic way, to consider all of the assets, everything that governments can call upon to build stronger, fairer, more sustainable communities. And culture has to be part of this. We need to avoid taking hasty decisions for fear of losing the things that make our society so rich, that drive well-being, that drive health, as I hope we'll hear from Christopher Bailey later, um, but also avoiding making sure that we're bearing cultural issues in mind in order not to, not to cause unintended consequences. Too often in the past, culture has been seen as a, a nice to have and not a necessary thing, something that you come to last, as something on the edges of government, not as the most interesting or powerful ministry. We need to change this, both within the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, but generally, which of course is the objective of the Culture 2030 Goal campaign as a whole. Therefore, for us in the statement and to answer the question set of what this means for us, first of all, the input focus on equality, on access, that culture is something that can improve the lives of everyone and that we need to find ways of doing things that ensure that creators at all levels of their careers, at all levels of success, are adequately supported, that they can continue producing work and also to ensure that everyone then has access to them, that what culture brings can bring to absolute, can be brought to everybody. We also strongly agree with the support that the uh, stimulus packages are, being, are bringing in at least some countries to cultural actors and believe that this needs to be generalized. Again, key point of the declaration. We've seen great examples, for example, in Barcelona of stimulus packages being used to restock library collection in one action, supporting libraries and their users, supporting local bookshops and supporting authors, all of which are powerful steps and should be welcomed. And finally, the our point underlined in the statement that as we go forwards, we have an opportunity to build back better. We have an opportunity to build cultural policies that really are at the heart of government action that really do focus, that really do focus on taking a holistic approach where the benefits that culture can bring are recognized across government, are included, that culture is no longer a marginal thing, but really central, and that its benefits can be felt across the action of government. Therefore, I would allow that's me done. What I would now like to do is hand over to Christopher Bailey from the World Health Organization who will offer his perspectives on how culture and the arts can help with health. So Christopher, over to you. Oh, thanks so much, Stephen. And may I say before I begin, uh, what a wonderful collection of people and organizations and souls you've gathered here today. And uh, many things that I wanted to touch on have already been said. So I am going to focus on uh, a personal reflection and then an institutional reflection on the statement, which of course we welcome. About a year ago, I was in New York at the UN for uh, a meeting on the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Uh, I am severely visually impaired and I gave a performance piece on what blindness is like. And when I was done, there was a man named David who came up to me and we embraced. Uh, you see, David was my stage manager when I was a student actor uh, as a young man, when I went to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. He was the stage manager for most of the student shows for decades. 
Now, him coming to see me as a UN professional was a blessing, but in fact, it wasn't unusual. Uh, every time during my professional career that I had a show in New York, he would be there. Every time I would come in my UN capacity, he would be there. And it wasn't just me, it was dozens of students that he engaged with. Uh, and, and even online, his page was a town square where our family of theater diaspora could learn through him what we were doing, how we were doing, and, and to celebrate being artists uh, around the world. Two weeks ago, he died of COVID-related pneumonia. The silence that followed for our family was chilling. It is the same silence that we find in every performance space around the world. To a performer, the silence of an empty stage of an abandoned audience must give us pause, not just for the silence we're feeling in the moment, but knowing how difficult it is for many performance, live performance entities out there to survive under normal circumstances, a chilling doubt crosses across the mind of how these entities are going to survive in the future. The loss of an individual multiplied hundreds and thousands of times is something that is particularly heartbreaking due to the nature of this disease, the loneliness of it. When, when, when someone suffering from COVID is in the hospital and family members and loved ones cannot share that experience with them, the, the pain of that is even greater. I think it was Carl Jung, the great Swiss psychologist who once said, loneliness is not the absence of people, loneliness is the inability to express what matters to you most. And this, I think, is where the role of the artist can be most deeply felt, add greatest value, and where its absence is noticed so profoundly. At WHO, we have been heartened and inspired by the response of the artistic community, both in our Together at Home concert series of musical pop stars that came together for the largest online fundraiser in the history of fundraising, but also through the visual artists that have come together in our solidarity shows in collaboration with Create 2030, or the theater professionals that are coming together now and projects that will be coming up and, and poets. The, the part of this that is so moving to us is that artists are not only some of the first people to offer up their talents, but are also the group that is most likely to be affected by the economic downturn. So that sacrifice is certainly noted and and as some of our colleagues have today stated, the worry that these people are expected sometimes to offer up their services for free is something that we have to be mindful of. Uh, the people who need to invest in the artists for this purpose. You see, art is a key aspect of health. Last November, WHO released the very first research report showing the evidence base for the health benefits of the arts. <clears throat> this came out of our Copenhagen office. And if you see, if you read this report, you will see quantitative evidence that the arts can help not only in, in effective health messaging, uh, in this case in COVID, to wash your hands, hands, to maintain physical distancing, to try and stay at home, but also to build that sense of community, to comfort each other in times of loneliness. And in a period where, where meaning is elusive and chaos and anxiety are rampant, to find the meaning of it. 
and particularly when the future is uncertain, to use our imaginations to imagine that future. You see, at WHO, health is not just the absence of disease, but rather it's the attainment of the highest physical, mental, and social well being. And certainly the arts are one way that our species has evolved to, to bring that sense of well being to each individual, to our communities, and to our society as a whole. Yes, Stephen, you're right. Arts are not just a nice to have. They are a must have if we're serious about investing in our society for the well being of all. Uh, and I, I thank you and all of your partners for coming up with this statement. And I do hope you, you have a chance to, to look at our report and, and perhaps it can be useful to engage policymakers to show not just the financial incentives for investing in the arts, but the, the psychological benefits, the social benefits, and, and certainly using our imaginations as artists to try and forge that unknown path ahead and create a world that we would be happy to give to our children. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher, for such a powerful intervention and such a, a great way of summing up the message that we've been looking to give throughout this webinar and indeed with the statement itself. I wanted to, before we close and ask for questions, I wanted to make sure that all of you have the opportunity to look at the web page that's being created, culture2030goal.net. You can see the URL is relatively simple to go for. Um, please do, if you're watching, have a look at this page. You will see that there's an explanation of the statement. And then as I said, we have the statement in a number, number of languages. You are able, and of course, we encourage you to sign up, to put your name to this, because we would like to be able to share this message with the ministers, the senior officials, and the UN officials who will be taking part in the high-level political forum at the United Nations, the key annual event on the Sustainable Development Goals this July. However, of course, as you will have guessed from the title, Culture 2030 Goal, our perspective is much longer than this. We, would want, we want to make sure that not only in the last 10 years of the Sustainable Development Goal, but in whatever comes next, culture is really central to action. That as we've said so many times, culture is not peripheral, but central. That all it can contribute, all of its potential is realized. So we very much encourage you to read the statement, sign up, sign on if you can. And in doing so, you will have the option to leave your email in order to hear any further updates. I would now like to ask if anyone has questions. We have the chat on YouTube, and I will be keeping an eye on that in order to see if there are any points made. Just to give a quick summary of the points we've heard so far, there are a couple of questions about whether this webinar will be in Spanish. We will provide a transcription, which of course we can then put into Spanish subsequently. And I'll now wait to hear if there are any further points. Of course, if any others of, the, of our panelists would like to add anything at this point, you're more than welcome. Please endorse the statement. It's a good message. Okay, or do I you think for a comment. Yes, uh, Stephen, you, you you perhaps you were perhaps going to to say the, the same, um, but just to 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 share with everybody that the campaign is uh, willing to become uh, stronger with more members and also more effective and that the eight organizations that uh, wrote, uh, published and uh, today are launching this statement are undergoing a process of, of uh, say analysis of how we can be stronger 
uh, more and, and more effective and that you will hear from us very soon. Thank you very much. So I'm not seeing any questions on the YouTube channel. However, we are here, we are around. So as before, please do go to the Culture 2030 Goal website. You can get in contact with us through there and ask your questions directly if you have any. If you have any. Please do, of course, those who are members of the organizations who have been represented throughout this call, please do get in touch with your teams and ask for more. As Jordi said, the more we are, the stronger we are, and the clearer the message is that culture needs to be central, both in the response to COVID-19 and to our planning for the recovery. Thank you very much for your time. And of course, we hope very much that we will see you in future events organized by the campaign and that you will be with us as we look to achieve the goal of making sure that culture really realizes its potential. Thank you.